the start of two uh, lectures about early pregnancy loss uh, in, and that follows the lecture of the normal pregnancy. Um, pregnancy loss will be, the current lecture will focus on miscarriage. Um, I prefer this word much more above and beyond abortion because that's linked to termination of pregnancy and uh, has quite a different connotation. The third lecture uh, later on will deal with ectopic pregnancy and gestational trophoblastic disease. But today we focus on miscarriage. I think this is a quite an important topic because miscarriage is quite common and is essential for every doctor dealing with pregnant women to know the in and outs of diagnosis and treatment. Here on the right hand side we see the material of a spontaneous abortion. The gestational sac has been expelled and within we can see an embryo of about 8-9 uh, weeks. Again we follow the same sequence. What are symptoms pointing at miscarriage? What findings at physical examination? What is the use of the absolute value of the beta hcg in serum? What can we visualize when we use an ultrasound scan? And last but not least, what management options do we have and what are the pros and cons? Quite common, about 12 to 19 weeks of all pregnancies finish in a miscarriage. And if you would include early uh, miscarriages, so the menstrual miscarriages, this figure is probably higher. The most common cause of miscarriage is a chromosomal abnormality. And the most common one is uh, monosomy 45, so that's Turner's syndrome. Um, this is important to know because women who are confronted with the loss of an early pregnancy uh, of course ask the question why and explaining that is quite often caused by chromosomal abnormality hence can be viewed as a selection mechanism of mother nature that is sometimes um, a little comforting thought. What are risk factors? There are a, a whole number. Um, aging is a risk factor. For instance, a woman of the age of 44, 3, 44 years has a risk of 51% that a pregnancy will miscarry, based on the chromosomal abnormality risk, of course. Uterine malformations, for instance, a uterine septum can result in a miscarriage. Um, then various infections, rubella, toxoplasma, CMV, but they are not very common in, in Australia. Diabetes, poorly controlled diabetes, renal disease, thyroid dysfunction, alcohol abuse, heavy smoking, and the antiphospholipid syndrome are all contributing to a high risk that an early pregnancy will end up result in a miscarriage. When we discuss miscarriage, we use different definitions and it's paramount to understand what we mean by various definitions. Let me go through them step by step. First, threatened miscarriage. Threatened miscarriage is a description of the symptoms of bleeding, pain, and the cervical os is still closed. So it's more a description rather than a diagnosis. Inevitable miscarriage means that the cervical os has, is now open as a result of the uterine contractions and the, uh, the cervical os, os, os is open to the palpating finger. So this is a diagnosis made after physical examination. Incomplete, incomplete miscarriage means the lady involved has still ongoing symptoms of bleeding, loss of clots of tissue and pain. And the ultrasound scan still shows a heterogeneous mass in the uterus which is usually more than 15 millimeters. By the way, there is no obvious black and white cutoff point, but this is a rule of thumb. A miss miscarriage means a lady has still pain and bleeding or might have no symptoms whatsoever. 
and on an ultrasound scan we can see, we can visualize an intact gestational sac with a closed cervix. So missed miscarriage means the miscarriage still needs to take place. What are typical symptoms for a miscarriage? One, bleeding and abdominal pain, lower abdominal pain, which is cramping in nature. The woman will recognize the pain as menstrual pain. About a half of the women will eventually miscarry when the woman presents with bleeding and pain. So presenting with threatening miscarriage means before you have done an examination, 50% will miscarry and 50% will uh, have an, an ongoing pregnancy. This figure is much lower if fetal heartbeat beat is detected. So when the ultrasound scan can visualize fetal heartbeat, we can be quite optimistic about the outcome of the miscarriage. Very important diagram which depicts beautifully the various diagnoses on top, the findings at ultrasound scan, the amount of vaginal bleeding and the amount of uterine pain. So in the first part of the diagram the woman is in principle asymptomatic. Here we see that the bleeding starts, intensifies, the woman loses clots and at the same time the pain is at its peak here. As a result of the cramping of the uterine cramps, the uterus, the os, is open and the products of conception, the gestational sac, is being expelled. Later on, we see the os closes, uterine cavities empty, and here we're dealing with a complete miscarriage. Knowledge of the physiology of a miscarriage, of this process, is very important because a woman who presents in one of these stages would like to know what to expect and it's important for us as doctors that we can describe the, yeah, the median of the symptoms. Of course we never can be, we're never able to predict precisely how long it will take. I think a very important diagram to know for everybody who is dealing with early pregnancy and miscarriage. Examination. Examination in an exam setting when the student should always ask for what are the vitals. Is the lady hemodynamically stable? What, are the, what is the blood pressure, the pulse rate, the respiratory rate? Does she have symptoms of fainting or a clammy skin? Examination of the abdomen usually reveals nothing of concern when the, in case of a miscarriage, but in early pregnancy we have to actively search for signs of hemoperitoneum which would be consistent with a bleeding ectopic pregnancy. Usually the uterus is not palpable unless the pregnancy is more than 12 weeks. Speculum examination. Our eyes search for the cause of the bleeding. Primarily, of course, you focus on the cervix. Is the bleeding coming from the os? Is the os open or closed? Or is there another cause of the bleeding? It could be a cervical polyp or in extreme rare cases, a, uh, uh, the first presentation of a cervical cancer. Then, important to find out with the palpating finger, is the cervical os open or not? In the case the os is open, it's, it's classified as an inevitable miscarriage. Uh, sometimes a woman might present uh, with some clots or tissue she might have lost, she, would, she has lost, and she wants to know, is this my miscarriage? If you would rinse the tissue uh, and the clots she had brought along under uh, water, and you uh, rinse it off, and then you float the tissue in a dish of water, then you can sometimes see um, font-like structure like here and there. So this is typical for trophoblast. Here we see the gestational sac, a little embryo here, and the villi of the trophoblast. So this is typical for pregnancy tissue, and that is not visible in case of a clot, which you can, which one can rinse off completely. Miscarriage and beta-HCG. Usually, uh, 
the pregnant woman might will have done already a home pregnancy test, which are quite reliable and quite sensitive nowadays. A pregnancy test is not a useful predictor for the outcome because the beta-CG will stay positive for quite a while. The ultrasound is the tool number one to determine whether the pregnancy is viable or not. Later on in the third lecture of this uh, trilogy we will discuss uh, more about the uh, BDSG. There are a number of ultrasound features uh, which point at pregnancy failure, so the pregnancy is lost, there is no more hope. Firstly, and very important, that the gestational sac, if the mean diameter is more than 25 mm, that means pregnancy failure. If we can visualize a crown rump length of more or equal to 7 mm without heartbeat, the same conclusion must be drawn. And here we have two other criteria which point at pregnancy failure. If this is the case, it's important that we as doctors um, are able to break bad news with the woman and her partner and family and not beat around the bush and not say well let's repeat the scan one week later because that there is no hope for an ongoing pregnancy. So with a lot of empathy break the bad news and tell her unfortunately that the baby has died. Um, conclusive, regardless of symptoms, more or less bleeding, regardless of how many, we how many weeks the duration of the pregnancy is. And I noticed this is for junior doctors a hard call because you feel you are the bad person having to break, break bad news and sometimes uh, uh, they te uh, one tends to say, oh, let's repeat a scan in one week or let's repeat the BCG in 48 hours. That, that would be misleading and not very helpful in my opinion. Then uh, here a number of criteria which point at uncertain viability. I think that's not for students to know but more for junior doctors who are working in a women's assessment unit dealing with early pregnancy. Here, there, if the following criteria are met, there is a suspicion of pregnancy failure, but it is not yet certain. The sac diameter is 16 to 24 millimeters and no embryo is visible. A sac with a crown ramp length of less than 7 millimeters and no heartbeat and so forth and so on. That means in case of these findings it's advisable to repeat the ultrasound scan a week later because as we have shown in the normal pregnancy one week must make a big difference in a case of a normal embryonic development. So here is it uh, appropriate to sit on the fence and to repeat the ultrasound scan a week to 10 days later. A few ultrasound pictures to illustrate this. A transvaginal ultrasound scan which shows a pseudo sac. Inside the uterine cavity there is some fluid but this is not a pregnancy sac. If the lady would tilt her pelvis, the fluid would shift to one side. Here we see an ultrasound scan of an early intrauterine gestational sac. The sac is asymmetrical in the uterine cavity and surrounded by a white equidense ring which represents the chorion. This is consistent with an early intrauterine pregnancy. What do we mean by an M embryonic pregnancy or an empty sac? The transvaginal ultrasound scan shows no fetal pole, no embryo visible, whilst the mean sac diameter is more or equal to 16 mm. On a transabdominal scan, the same findings if the sac is more than 25 mm or equal to 25 mm. You see, this shows clearly that the transvaginal scan is more sensitive. A picture to illustrate. We see here a somewhat collapsed gestational sac with a mean diameter of 1.9 cm. The gestational age is certain 
10 weeks plus, there is no yolk sac, no embryo, hence this ultrasound scan is conclusive. There is no need to repeat the BTSG, there is no hope and repeating the ultrasound scan in one week is not the most appropriate care. A missed miscarriage here with um, a lady with a certain gestational age of 11 weeks and some PV spotting. We see a mean gestational sac of 2.4 centimeters. That's consistent with seven to eight weeks, whilst we know she is most certainly 11 weeks pregnant. There is, if you look very careful here, a, a yolk sac within, but there is no embryo visible. This means the ultrasound scan is conclusive. Another ultrasound scan, now it's a transabdominal scan, um, it's a missed miscarriage. The lady presents at 10 weeks gestation, cer certain duration and some spotting, hardly any pain. The transabdominal scan with a full bladder shows an embryo of 1.25 cm, which is consistent with 7 weeks and 3 days without heartbeat. So, based on the ultrasound scan and the gestational age, the conclusion is there, this is a non viable pregnancy. Is the miscarriage complete or incomplete? The clinical findings are paramount, because if the os is still open, it means the miscarriage is still ongoing. If there's still loss of blood and uh, there's still pain. Um, but in case you doubt, an ultrasound scan can sometimes be helpful. And we see here an ultrasound scan where the cavity is not yet empty. Same finding here, there's a lot of material inside the uterus and this is most likely consistent with an incomplete miscarriage. However, in my opinion, an incomplete or complete is primarily a clinical diagnosis. Here we see an example of a very clear uh, a stripe of the endometrium, which is more consistent. Here we see the contour of the uterus. And this finding is more consistent with a complete miscarriage. What are treatment options? In general, conservative expensive management is a good option, medical management and surgical management, dilatation and curatage, DNC. When should we prefer what option? If the patient is hemodynamically unstable and there's ongoing heavy bleeding, we should uh, offer a DNC. The same applies when, a when there is a febrile, when the lady has fever and there, it's a febrile miscarriage, DNC is indicated. But in case of an incomplete miscarriage, it's important to note that expectant management results usually in a complete miscarriage. In other words, Mother Nature is well capable to uh, do the job. Medical and surgical management um, ha hasten this proce process, so it's, it's done a little bit quicker, uh, as was demonstrated in the Cochrane Review by Nielsen in 2013. If we focus now on management of miscarriage less than 13 weeks, Expected management, essential to explain this process of spontaneous miscarriage. What can the woman expect pain-wise and bleeding-wise? About 52% of women will have a complete miscarriage after one week and 85% will have a complete miscarriage after two weeks. So it's reasonable to offer expected management for about two weeks. If there is after two weeks no complete miscarriage as yet, it's reasonable to move to medical or surgical treatment options. Medical management. Um, mesoprostol tablets of 200 microgram are administered, and mesoprostol is a prostaglandin E1 analog. Um, it stimulates the myometrium. It results in contractions, so in period type pain, 
which eventually results in opening up of the cervix and expelling of the products of conception. Um, there are different regimens, uh, 600 micrograms of mesoprostol every day, uh, sorry, every 12 hours, four times in a row, results in a complete miscarriage rate of 80 to 91 percent. Um, vaginal ex uh, uh, administration is preferred because oral and vaginal have the same efficacy, however, with vaginal ex um, um, administration there is less side effects of diarrhea. Surgical management, dilatation and curatage. A couple of diagrams to explain what the suction, what the curatage uh, means. In the panel here we can see a diagram, speculum is inserted, a tenaculum is placed on the anterior lip of the cervix to stretch the uterus to uh, remove uh, let's say if the uterus is antiviral or retroviral, to make sure that the cervix and uterus are more in line to reduce the likelihood of a perforation. Cannula is visible. Here on the right hand side we see the suction device. Is now the tip of the suction device is in the uterine cavity after the cervix has been dilated with dilators. Here is the suction device. Here on the left hand side we see the, 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 the classical curette, which is in fact an open spoon which can be used to verify if the mm, suction device or, uh, has resulted in a complete miscarriage. Here an overview of the, the suction tubing and the various diameters 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 millimeters of the suction cannulas. The rule of thumb is that we use the cannula the diameter of the cannula equal to the gestational age. For instance, seven weeks, you could use a cannula of seven millimeters, but that's only a rule of thumb. Risk of DNCs are infection, not very high, of course, in, if the DNC is done in sterile circumstances, uterine perforation, um, and very rarely um, intrauterine adhesions, the so-called Asherman syndrome, um, and there is a link with preterm birth in a sense that the cervix might be weakened by the process of somewhat forced dilatation. This picture shows Asherman syndrome, which is intrauterine adhesions as a consequence of uh, an infection, and in particular, postpartum, a firm postpartum DNC is um, infamous for this complication. Um, what if we compare vaginal mesoprostol, the medical management, versus, versus surgical management? There's a significant reduction in the need for surgery, approximately two more days of bleeding when we look at medical management compared to surgical management, more need for analgesia, the cramps are sometimes quite heavy, but there is no significant differences in the need for blood transfusion pelvic infection, nausea, vomiting and diarrhea. So important that if a woman is hemodynamically stable and not non-febrile that we offer her expected management or medical management as very uh, reliable uh, options rather than going to the knee-jerk from the past miscarriage equals DNC. This graph shows on the vertical axis the serum beta and CG levels and on the horizontal axis the weeks after evacuation. The red line here shows the term pregnancy. So after the delivery of the placenta, two weeks later, the beta HCG level is less than two. After an induced abortion, after a termination of pregnancy, which is not part of this trilogy, after four weeks, and later on we will discuss the blue and the red graph uh, in the lecture number three. So important to know that after a miscarriage, it can take a few weeks till the BTSG returns to uh, undetectable levels. So for miscarriage management, regardless of the management, expectant surgical or medical, 
uh, almost every woman is overwhelmed by emotions, disappointment, feels guilty, might be angry, etc. Don't underestimate the intensity of those feelings and never ridicule it. So tender love and care, explanation that this, that this response, this psychological response is part of a miscarriage is an important integral part of the management of uh, any miscarriage. Um, if the lady is resist negative, the administration of IM, administration of an NTD is essential to prevent sensitization for future pregnancies. In conclusion, miscarriages are quite common. Ultrasound is key to the diagnosis. Management, three options, expected and management and, ex and medical management avoid surgery, are more cost effective, and miscarriage should no longer be the dilatation and curatage. Offer the woman an informed choice. Always discuss the psychological impact and NTD. This is the end of the lecture. And as always, if you have comments, if you have questions, please drop me an email. Thank you for your attention.